Okay, let's make a start. So today I'm going to talk about TRIP steels, where you all know that TRIP stands for transformation induced plasticity, right? So when we did the lectures on martensite, you saw that the phase transformation actually produces a shape change. And these steels exploit that shape change. This is the inside of a car door. And do you know what this is? Sorry? Yeah, so what is the function? Sa side. Uh, so if you get impact from the side, then it basically transmits forces throughout your body, and therefore, the, uh, not your body, but the car body. <laughs> yeah. And therefore, you know, you absorb energy and you also prevent intrusion from the side. Your car is severely damaged, but Hopefully the passenger compartment is okay. Yeah, and the this is actually made out of uh, a trip steel, trip assisted steel. We'll say, I'll explain the difference later. And of course, um, this is also a part of a car uh, body, and you can see this joint here, which is made by laser welding, to create a tailored blank. Do you know what a tailored blank is? So, you know, when you make a very sophisticated dress, uh, it's not made out of one kind of cloth, right? It's made out of different pieces of cloth which have different functions. Just like that, uh, supposing you are thinking about corrosion, the lower part of the car door is more susceptible to corrosion than the upper part. So you can make it thicker and the top part you can make it thinner. or uh, you can make one part out of trip steel and another part out of dual phase steel, etc. So this is now quite common, this kind of technology where you know the whole component is not made from one single steel, but you start with a flat object, two different kind of steels joined together. Do you know how this joining happens? Hmm? Laser, yeah. So uh, this is provided by the, either by the steel manufacturer or someone who buys the different kinds of steels and does the joining to the car manufacturer. And this is after the forming operation, which you are an expert on, right? Yeah. So even after forming, you can see the, the weld remains, remains intact. And this particular object is in this part of the mini. Okay, this, this particular mini is called the Clubman. It's a, it's a little bit longer than the normal mini and it's very popular. Yeah, the cost of this is approximately 12 to 15,000 pounds. So that's about uh, uh, $20,000 or 20 million won. Basically because it looks very nice and also it's German engineering, okay, which is very, very good. So, so you don't make the car out of a single steel or, or a door out of a single steel, you make it so that you can reduce the weight, but you have the right kind of material in the right kind of place. And trip steels form a part of the tailored blanks. Okay, so why trip steels? Well, this is a, a normal sort of steel. And you know you've got a strength of the order of 450 megapascals, and really quite a, a large elongation. But if you want to make your car lighter, uh, then you've got to have greater strength so that you can use a thinner piece of material. But you know these guys will tell you that you really need a lot of ductility as well, so that you can form those complicated shapes very very quickly, right? So. The trip steels that we will go to later on in the lecture are actually quite strong. So here, you know, you've got a yield strength of about 750 megapascals, and you still have quite a lot of elongation. The uniform elongation is of the order of 25 yeah? percent. Now, of course, this is not the only test that you do in order to measure formability. Uh, you can talk to him later on to find out many more details. but the fundamental test you do first is a tensile test 
And if you get lots of uniform ductility, then you proceed on to more complicated tests. Okay? So why do we get this kind of behavior? And uh, what is the role of transformation-induced plasticity in achieving this kind of behavior? Okay, so this is a, a fully arsenatic steel, which is transformed partly to martensite by cooling to minus 80 degrees centigrade. And to get it fully austenitic, there's about 38 percent of nickel in it to stabilize the austenite. So martensite forms at a very low temperature. Right? So clearly, this is not a steel that you use normally. Why is that? It's incredibly expensive in the context of steels. Okay? It's not really that expensive. But we worry when we are making hundreds of uh, millions of tons of steel to add this much nickel. But the point is that when the martensite forms, you get a deformation. And what we are going to do is to try and work out, if we have a fully oscillating material, what is the elongation that we get in a tensile test when we form martensite. Okay? You know the nature of this deformation. It's an invariant plane strain with a shear strain of about 0 0.26 and a dilatation normal to the habit plane. This is the habit plane of uh, roughly 3%. Okay? So how does that contribute to elongation in a tensile test? That's what we are going to try and work out. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is to define uh, a deformation matrix. So this is our original austenite, and when it transforms, it, there's a shear strain and there's a dilatation. And here is a coordinate system where these are unit vectors. Z1 lies in the habit plane, and Z2 is normal to the habit, uh, Z3 is normal to the habit plane, and Z two points outside if you take a right-handed set here. Yeah. Okay? So this is an autonormal coordinate system. That means all the vectors are unit vectors and they are at 90 degrees to each other. So the way to define a deformation matrix is very simple, uh, given that these axes are very well aligned to the body. You know, this lies in the habit plane, this is normal to the habit plane. So what happens to a vector which is parallel to Z1 because of the transformation? So the indices of Z1 would be 0, 0, uh, 1, 0, 0. Yeah. 1 along Z, 0 along, along Z2, and 0 along Z3. So this, uh, the indices of this are 1, 0, 0. What happens to that as a result of the transformation? it remains exactly the same because there, nothing in the habit plane changes, right? So we take 1, 0, 0 and write a column here. Uh, P is this deformation and Z simply says that you know, you're defining the deformation with respect to a coordinate system which consists of three basis vectors, Z1, Z2 and Z3. Okay, okay what happens to Z2 because of this deformation? It remains the same because Z2 is also in the habit plane. So we write 0, 1, 0. And Z3 here, it becomes this, doesn't it? So what is its coordinate along Z1? Yeah, it's S, isn't it? Because the, this distance is 1 and this is S. So if I project this point onto Z1, it's S. Uh, there's no coordinate along Z2, and Z3 becomes 1 plus delta. So this is what happens to the vector Z3 because of the martensitic transformation. Is everyone happy with how we got the deformation matrix? We simply look at three vectors, uh, which are the basis vectors. Uh, Z1, Z2, Z3. Apply the deformation and look at the new coordinates of what used to be Z1, Z2, Z3. Okay? Okay, so that's our deformation matrix. And what's the use of the deformation matrix? Well, 
if I multiply it by any vector, and we can define that as a single column matrix, uh, then I know the coordinates of that vector as a result of this deformation. So supposing I have an arbitrary vector which is pointing this way, and let's say it's 1, 2, 3. I multiply uh, a unit vector by this, and I will know what happens to that vector, its orientation and also its magnitude. Okay? Okay, so uh, here is that operation. Uh, this is our matrix, and this is the vector u, which is defined as a unit vector, which is a column. Yeah, its components are in a column matrix, a single column matrix. And when I operate the deformation on u, I obtain a new vector v. All right, so it, that's illustrated over here. This is the original vector u, and this is the new vector v. Now notice that the magnitude v is not the same as u, and its orientation is also not the same as u, okay, in general. There may be certain vectors which, after you deform, they will stay in the same orientation. There's a particular name for those vectors. What? Hmm? What, sorry, what, uh, eigenvector you said, right? Yeah, yeah, or principal axes. Yeah. Okay, so let's imagine that we have a vector u which is 1, 0, 1 in our coordinate system z. Uh, to find out what happens to this because of this deformation, we simply take the matrix and multiply it. So the matrix P is given by 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Um, delta, right? S, sorry. S, 0, 1 plus delta. And you multiply it by 1, 0, 1. Okay? So it's rho multiplied by column. So the first component of the new vector is 1 plus S. Yeah? You can see 1 times 1 plus S times 1. Okay? So the first, column, uh, first component is 1 plus S. 0, 1, 0 times 1, 0, 1 gives me 0. And 0, 0, 1 plus delta times this gives me 1 plus delta. All right? So this is what happens to the vector u as a consequence of Martin-Siddick transformation in the coordinate system z. Yeah? So if I work out the magnitude of this, then uh, I can see how much it has elongated. Yeah? Uh, and In this case, um, I, I'm looking at strain rather than the length. So it's 1 minus the magnitude of the vector v divided by the magnitude of vector u, and it comes to 0 0.14. Now, the plate of martensite can be oriented in many different ways, right? So we need to discover, you know, which is the orientation that will give us the biggest elongation. Okay? How can I do that? Yeah, so you've got a tensile axis, and you can form plates in many, 20, in each austenite grain, you can form it in 24 different orientations. So we need to uh, you know, look at the deformation I'll just skip to this slide, okay, uh, where we are um, transforming to martensite under the influence of a stress. So this is that heavily alloyed material. And if I put it at uh, minus 44 degrees centigrade and then apply a stress, then I get lots of martensite. Now this is a specimen which doesn't have a parallel gauge length, but it's tapered. That means in a single test, you can have different stresses and obtain all this information. If I show you the micrograph at one of these regions, okay, this is the orientation of the tensile axis, and this is a polycrystalline austenite. 
But can you see that this is not a random microstructure? You know, there's a certain orientation at which the plates form. And wh what is roughly that orientation? Yeah? It's louder? Uh, so this is the stress axis. Yeah? Yeah. Roughly 45 degrees. Uh, why is that? Plane of maximum shear stress. And you know that the shear strain is dominant, right? So basically, uh, the volume change will only alter that angle slightly. Yeah? But remember, this is polycrystalline. So the plates are not free to form at the exact angle. You know, it depends on the orientation of the osnite. But there are 24 orientations in each grain, so it's possible to find one which is close to the 45-ish degrees. Yeah? OK, so how do we work out which orientation is favored, right? Uh, well, first of all, uh, just to remind you, martensite forms when a critical value of the driving force is obtained. Yeah? So if this is the free energy of alpha and this is the free energy of gamma as a function of temperature, when this driving force for transformation reaches a critical value, then you trigger martensite. Okay? So if you add to this driving force by applying a stress, then you will change the martensite start temperature. So you know at minus 44, there is no martensite in that alloy, uh, the tapered tensile specimen. But if I apply stress, then I stimulate martensite because the stress interacts with the shape deformation of martensite. Okay, just, just like slip, you know, if you apply a stress, you will get dislocations moving. There's no chemical driving force there, but here we have a phase transformation, which is also a deformation. So a stress can trigger martensitic transformation. Right, so this, is, this was our free energy curve uh, for the difference between gamma and alpha, and when it reaches a critical value, we trigger martensitic transformation, right? If I add a driving force to delta G, then you can see that I can reach that critical value at a higher temperature, which we call ms sigma. Right? So that's, that's what uh, the stress does. And I need to find out what the value of U is. Okay. Uh, how can I work out the interaction energy between the stress and the martensitic transformation? Then I can predict, you know, the orientation of the martin side that will form and uh, the amount. So if this is my plate of martin side, okay, and if I apply a stress sigma here, okay, and this is the habit plane, and let's say the direction of shear is along here, shear only interacts with shear stress, right? And the normal stress on that plane will only interact with the volume change, the dilatational strain. So the interaction energy U is equal to the shear stress resolved on the habit plane, shear stress resolved on habit plane, in shear direction. Okay. Uh, multiplied by the shear strain, right? So that's an energy. Stress times strain is an energy per unit volume, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, you know, normally when you have elastic loading, say sigma times epsilon, you say that the this is the energy, right? So why haven't I got a factor of a half? In this, why haven't I got a factor of a half? Because this is half sigma epsilon, right? It's plastic. Martin Cedric transformation gives you plastic strain, not elastic strain. It's a permanent strain, right? 
And then we have to add another term, which is the normal stress on the habit plane multiplied by the dilatational strain. So this is the normal stress on the habit plane. and multiplied by the dilatational strain. Again, this is a plastic deformation. So I need to be able to work out the resolved shear stress and the resolved normal stress as a function of the applied stress sigma. Okay? So I've got a, a plate of martensite at a particular orientation. I've applied a stress and I need to work out the shear stress in the shear direction on the habit plane and the normal stress on that as well. So what's the best method to do this? A diagrammatic method? Have you, have you done more circles? More circles? Yeah? Okay, so here is a more circle and let's say theta is the angle between the habit plane normal and the tensile axis. So if this is my tensile axis and the habit plane normal is here, then it's the angle between the habit plane normal and the tensile axis. And we've applied a stress which is sigma 1. And you know that on the Mohr circle we orient this at 2 theta rather than theta. Then the normal stress is, e is simply sigma 1 uh, cos 2 theta, sigma 1 upon 2, which is the radius of this circle, cos 2 theta plus sigma 1 upon 2. In other words, this, this bit here, right? And the shear stress is just resolving this um, along here. In other words, sigma 1 upon 2, the radius of the circles, times sine of 2 theta, okay? So, uh, So this is equal to sigma 1 upon 2 sine 2 theta into the shear strain S plus uh, sigma 1 upon 2 uh, plus sigma 1 upon 2 cos 2 theta into delta, right? You can see sigma 1 upon 2 plus sigma 1 upon 2 cos 2 theta. Happy with that? Okay, so I've got 24 possible orientations. How can I find the one which is going to interact most with the stress? The value of theta which will interact most. Yeah. So we simply take the derivative of u with respect to theta. So to find u max, you take du by d theta equals zero, okay? And prove for yourself that that will give you um, theta, um, 10 of 2 theta will be s over delta tangent of 2 theta will be S over delta. So just prove for yourself. And that will come out, you know, with the value of shear strain of uh, 0.26 and delta of 0.03, that will come out as approximately 44 or 47 degrees, okay? It won't be exactly 45 because obviously we've got a volume change interacting as well. And that's why when we made that tensile specimen, the tapered tensile specimen, you know, we are not getting martensite plates forming at many, many different orientations. They are forming, as long as you can, you know, the austenite orientation allows it, close to 45 degrees, okay? Even though these grains are all, austenite grains are all in different orientations with respect to the stress. Happy with that? Right. Yeah, here you are. 
uh, the differential of u with respect to theta, very simple, okay? And you set that to zero, and therefore you find tangent of two theta is given by s over delta, okay? That's the optimum orientation at which the Martin side plates will form. Right, so given that value of theta, we can work out the interaction energy u, okay, here. This is the resolved shear stress and the resolved normal stress. Straightforward calculation. And we define our vector u with that value of theta. Okay? That means the tensile axis is oriented at an angle theta to the normal. This is our tensile axis. Okay? We are pulling the material along u. And that is the orientation of that tensile axis. Uh, we multiply it by the deformation matrix and we get a new vector. And when you do the calculation, you'll find that 15% elongation. If the whole sample, if the entire sample transforms into the favored orientation, then you will get 15% elongation due to phase transformation alone. Okay? So, if entire sample transforms if all gamma transforms into favored orientation, then elongation is about 15%, just due to phase transformation. Okay. So that is uh, very large, right? 15% elongation. <coughs> now, this is slightly approximate here, because when we do a tensile test, you are keeping the axis of deformation constant. Okay? So we should, uh, you know, the orientation of V is not the same as U. Okay? You know, when, when the Martin side forms, you can see that this will not be parallel to this, all right? So that's a slight approximation that I've made. Okay, we can't use steels containing 30% nickel except in very tiny quantities, right? So trip steels, when they were originally discovered by Zeke and Parker back in, I think, 1970s, were heavily alloyed and really didn't make much progress. So how can we produce cheap austenite? That's the key to trip steels. Um, what is the cheapest alloying element? Hmm? Sorry? Uh, mm, even cheaper. Cheapest alloying element in steel. No, in fact, uh, when you make uh, your cast iron, you want to get rid of it. Carbon, right? Because you blow oxygen into the cast iron to burn off the carbon and reduce it to a level which is, uh, you know, consistent with the steel. So, we really sh want to use carbon to produce austenite. So, can I just make it with one weight percent carbon? Hmm? Why, why not? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, immediately you fail <laughs> if you add one weight percent carbon. So, we want uh, the austenite to contain more than one weight percent carbon because that will make it stable at room temperature. But we do not want the average composition of the steel to be high carbon so that you can spot weld it, it can elongate, and so forth. So, Let's say we add 0.15 weight percent of carbon to the steel. I want the carbon to move into a, a certain region where the austenite will stabilize, right? So how can I cause the carbon to move into a narrower region and increase its concentration to 1.2 weight percent? I've got 0.15 carbon in the steel and I want to sweep it into a narrower region. How can I do that? 
partitioning. Okay, so what we want to do is exploit the bainite transformation because the carbon escapes from bainite and then goes into the austenite and makes it richer. And we've already learned that you know you can cut this reaction off over here by adding silicon and anything else will stop that. Do you know of any other element? Aluminium as well. Aluminium hates to be inside cementite, just like silicon hates to be inside cementite. Okay, uh, but you know, if I just made my trip steel, uh, and we'll call this trip assisted because now the volume fraction of austenite is not 100 percent. Yeah, so it's assisted by trip as opposed to a trip steel. If I make it just from bainite, it might be too strong. So what what can I do about that? I can introduce another phase. I can form a lotriomorphic ferrite first, that also partitions carbon, right? And achieve the strength level that I want, which is of the order of 700 megapascals, not 1,600. Okay. So the actual trip assisted steels are produced in two different ways. One is you start from the hot rolling condition. So it's fully austenitic, and then you allow it to cool so that you form a lotriomorphic ferrite. Approximately 70% of the structure is a lotriomorphic ferrite. That pushes carbon. Then you allow bainite to form, and that pushes more carbon. And that bainite austenite mixture is quite stable, so you end up finally with retained austenite, a lotriomorphic ferrite, bainite and maybe some mud inside as well, okay? but not much. The second method is intercritical annealing. So you cold roll your steel, and you know that's how most trip-assisted steels are made. Cold roll it into the thickness that you want, and then you do intercritical annealing in a continuous annealing line. Right? You, you've seen all this, haven't you? You've seen continuous annealing line? In POSCO or somewhere? Huge, huge thing, you know, where the strip goes like this, right? Have you seen it? Okay. okay. Uh, so, you know, if you want to go and see in POSCO, it's very, very easy to arrange that, yeah? Um, so, intercritically anneal, uh, and that gives you a mixture of austenite and ferrite, and then allow bainite to form at a temperature of around 400 degrees centigrade. And that's quite important because what temperature is galvanizing down it? Yeah, around that temperature, right? Yeah. Okay. And that gives you the right structure. And this is what it looks like. So you can see uh, a lotriomorphic ferrite, which either forms by intercritical annealing or cooling from austenite. And you can see these regions here which are mixtures of bainitic ferrite and carbon-enriched retained austenite. And the concentration of carbon in the austenite is about 1.28%. But the average concentration is 0 0.15. So this is incredibly cheap austenite. Yeah, very, very clever method of producing cheap austenite. And we've got the silicon there to stop cementite from precipitating. And this gives you a certain amount of hardenability and control of the transformations. Okay. So this is a trip-assisted steel because the amount of austenite is actually quite small. Right, so the typical microstructure, let's say, has 70% allotriomorphic ferrite, 16% bainitic ferrite, and 14% retained austenite. I, I've chosen these numbers. Obviously, these are approximate, uh, just to avoid confusion in the equation. Okay. Uh, so we calculated that if we have 100% of austenite, then we would get 15% elongation just from transformation plasticity. But we don't have 100% austenite. So how do I do this calculation for 14% austenite? Yeah. Yeah. Both of you, I think, said that. You just scale this by 
the amount of austenite we have, right? Yeah, so we take this 0 0.15, multiply it by the volume fraction of austenite, which is 0 0.14, and therefore we get a, a strain which is 0 0.021, okay? And we only get 2.1 percent elongation from trip. That's very small, right? You know, if you repeat the tensile test, probably you see that much of a difference. So something is not right. You know, we are getting actually a lot of elongation in trip-assisted steels, and everyone says it's because of trip transformation plasticity. But our calculation shows that that can only contribute 2.1 percent elongation at most, maximum, if the martensite forms at the right orientation and all of the austenite transforms. So, should we really call these trip steels? Yeah. So, I wrote a paper, trip steels question mark, where I presented this calculation. Yeah. So, what's happening? Because we do get a lot of elongation. Yeah, this is the slide I showed you earlier. You can see that's 25 percent uniform elongation. So, it's not because of transformation plasticity. So, what could be causing it? Hmm? Uh, no, I mean this. This is full of ferrite. Yeah. But what's the key difference that you notice between these two curves? Yeah. And why do you think the hardening rate is greater? You are absolutely right. You can see that the work hardening rate is very high. And if you have a reasonably high work hardening rate, then you don't get plastic instabilities, right? In other words, necking. Yeah, so when you transform austenite containing 1.2 weight percent carbon to martensite, that's really hard martensite. It's very fine, so it doesn't cause cracking, but it's incredibly hard martensite, right? Containing 1.2 weight percent carbon, untempered. And that gives you work hardening. So you, you basically produce hard regions and soft regions in your structure. So the soft regions uh, absorb the deformation yeah, until very late stage in transformation where the martensite also begins to deform. So the work hardening is provided by the transformation, the stress-induced transformation. It isn't the fundamental contribution of the shape change due to martensitic transformation that gives us this enormous elongation, but its effect on the work hardening rate. Elongation. Yeah, yeah. If I eliminate the retained austenite, uh, I should only get two percent less elongation if if I can maintain the work hardening rate. But the work, yeah. So very simple test experiment you can do to prove this. Uh, we don't want to get rid of the austenite, but we want to show that you know it's the formation of martensite that matters. So. If I do the same experiment at 100 degrees centigrade, if I pull the sample at 100 degrees centigrade, then the austenite remains stable. And then you get poor elongation. Okay? Because uh, if you raise the temperature, you know, then austenite becomes more stable. And 100 degrees centigrade is uh, too low to affect carbide formation and so forth in the austenite. Yeah? Okay. There you go, work hardening. <laughs> okay. Right. So the elongation of trip assisted steel is not due to transformation plasticity per se, but because of work hardening due to the formation of hard martensite. Okay. Now there is one significant problem uh, in these trip assisted steels because you have silicon in your material. And Silicon causes the formation of uh, an oxide which is called phaolite. Phaolite, right? 
Uh, so Unju has worked on this for her master's thesis. Yeah. Uh, this picture actually might be from her thesis. Yeah. So um, this is a fair light, and it has a low melting temperature. So basically, it keys with the steel. That means it locks itself with the steel. Uh, and on top of it is iron oxide and then the more oxygen rich oxides, right? Now, of course, you can remove the oxides by descaling, yeah? But if this is very strongly tied to the surface, then it will retain some of this iron oxide as well, which later on oxidizes to Fe2O3, which is a red oxide. People don't like to see red patches on their steel. Uh, and it might also influence, you know, coating, surface quality, etc. So we need to design a triple sister steel which has a sufficiently low silicon concentration, right. so you don't form this uh, red oxide. And you mentioned that we can use aluminium, yeah. And the additional advantage of aluminium is it reduces the density even more. Uh, reduces the density of steel even more. Now, aluminium, uh, this part of the phase diagram you may not be familiar with, the high temperature part of the iron carbon phase diagram, but when you cool, the, what is the first phase to form? Hmm? Del delta ferrite, yeah, which is the same as alpha ferrite, but People call it delta because it's at high temperatures, yeah? And then it transforms into austenite and then back into a ferrite, which is alpha. So in this part of the phase diagram, we get delta ferrite. And aluminum has another effect, is that it makes the austenite at high temperatures less stable. So the delta ferrite fields expands. Yeah. So this is aluminum here. Uh, if I add a certain amount, we will not get any austenite at all, okay? Uh, no austenite at all. All this will be ferrite all the way from the melting temperature to room temperature. So we cannot add as much aluminium as we might want to unless you add other elements to control the amount of delta ferrite, yeah? And from our point of view, it doesn't matter whether it's delta ferrite or alpha ferrite, as long as it's ferrite. Uh, the 70 percent ferrite that we want, it's fine. So here is an alloy. This is all delta ferrite, okay? So it contains uh, aluminium, about 3 weight percent aluminium, 0.4 weight percent carbon, and the rest of it is transformed into the mixture of bainite and austenite. Now, it looks very strange, okay? If you, if you look from far away, it looks like a Chinese script, yeah? It looks very strange because these are actually the dendrites. And you can never make this alloy fully austenitic, yeah? Whatever temperature, until you go to melting, you cannot ever make it fully austenitic. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Delta remains stable for a large temperature range. And I said to you, this contains 0.4 weight percent carbon. Now, you might worry about that, right? Because spot welding will be affected if we have 0.4 weight percent carbon. But the carbon is harmful when you form regions of martensite. In this, you can never get 100% martensite, yeah? Because the delta ferrite is stable at all temperatures. But the concept is exactly the same, that we have a low silicon concentration. Uh, we've got aluminium, which has the dual role of stopping carbide precipitation and also reducing the density. So this steel has 5% less density than normal steel. And we've produced bainite in the usual way by transformation at around 400 degrees centigrade, and therefore partition more carbon, and therefore we have austenite. And I don't like banana plots. So I've actually got real, real data because the banana plots are nonsense, yeah? There's no such thing as an elliptical region or a rectangular region which defines the steel. 
So these are actual points from automotive steels. And uh, these points here are the TWIP steels, T-W-I-P, all right? And this is where the delta ferrite, uh, the, sorry, the delta trip steels, call these the delta trip steels. Delta trip, okay, fall. So they have, in some cases, combinations of elongation and strength which match the trip steels, but are much cheaper in terms of Yeah, yeah. It depends on how much aluminium you add, yeah. Uh, so, in this region here, I've got a mixture of ferrite and austenite. And of course, this is just the iron-aluminium diagram. We have other elements in, in it as well, like, yeah. Right, so, so the material produces combinations of strength and ductility, which are very good. And in fact, there's a paper called Extraordinary Ductility of These Steels. Yeah? The delta ferrite stays there. Uh, you know, in resistance spot welding, you've got very high heating rates, very high cooling rates. Yeah, but the delta ferrite is uh, stable. Yeah? So this is very promising. Okay? And uh, there are steel companies working on mass production of this. Now, when we add aluminium to steel, there are problems with the continuous casting. Yeah, do you know what the problem is? Yeah, so you know that there is a lot of activity now to make low density steels in which they are richly alloyed with aluminium. So hopefully that will help to resolve the production issues. So, you know, designing a steel is not easy. It's not just about phase transformations. It's about everything. In order to take a steel from concept to actual application, there's much more than one piece of expertise can handle. Okay, okay so in the next lecture, I will finish off on TWIP steels and then go on to the world's first bulk nanostructured material. Okay? Okay, thank you. Hmm. TWIP or TR? Yeah. Mm. So everybody talks about deformation uh, assisted drill. Right. But many papers talk about uh, stress assisted yeah. in the elastic zone itself. Like Correct. So it's a very, very good point. Okay. So if you look at all the papers, even when they talk about strain induced transformation, they actually do the calculation like this. Yeah, because when you pull a sample, you are not just plastically straining, you are applying a stress. And there are papers which show that you can completely ignore the plastic strain. You can do the calculations just by stress-induced. To do a proper experiment where you want to distinguish between stress-induced and strain-induced, you need to deform the austenite first and then transform. Not simultaneously apply a stress and strain. So there's only two papers in the literature where only strain is applied in the absence of stress. Yeah? So you first apply the stress to austenite and then generate martensite. And therefore, you can look at the effect of plastic strain. But there are maybe a thousand papers which loosely use the terminology strain-induced transformation, which, strictly speaking, is not correct. Uh, most of the effect comes from the stress. Yeah. So basically, if the strain energy in the elastic region is sufficient enough, that will transform. Right? Correct. That's Correct. Yeah. So there's no distinction. No, and it works very well. You know, if you just consider the stress alone as the driving force. Yeah.